Amen. Well, we're about to have some church up in here now. Now go on. I better get, get talking fast before I mess this up. All right, if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and flip open to Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. And today we are wrapping up our series, One Life, Jesus Letters to the Church. And um, if you missed those, you can go back on YouTube, uh, on our YouTube channel. You just go to youtube.com, type in CCC Morrisville, and all of our videos will come up. But basically, we've been looking at Jesus' letters to all of the churches across Asia. What was going on, there, there were these churches that had sprung up, and John, he was the elder in charge of overseeing all seven of these churches and the elders that represented those bodies. And, and Jesus had some some issues with those churches. If, if you find yourself disillusioned with church kind of as normal today, I think you're in great company because Jesus was disillusioned too. Uh, and so the same problems, some of the same garbage, some of the same stuff that, that goes on today that really frustrates the heart of God. It was going on then too in the church. And so Jesus appears and reveals himself to his best friend, John the Apostle, as John is exiled on the island of Patmos. And he says, listen, write this stuff down. I, I'm writing letters to each of these seven churches. There's things that I'm happy about. There's things that need to improve. And so you send a messenger to deliver my letter to these churches. Jesus wanted them to look at life his way. One way of looking at life. They, they, they let their lives be determined by their circumstances, the way they viewed life, whether they were rich or they were poor, whether it was a, a hardship or a struggle that was going on in their world. And Jesus wants them to know none of that stuff matters. It doesn't matter if you're rich. It doesn't matter if you're poor. It doesn't matter if you're going through a, a great time of success and prosperity or going through a horrible season of trial. Listen, you can look at life through my lens, this one way of looking at life. And so last week we looked at Jesus' final letter to the church at Laodicea. And Jesus' message to them was, listen, you are totally deceiving yourselves. You look at your life and you say, I'm rich. Look at the life I've made. I, 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 I'm the envy of all the world. I've made myself prosperous. I don't need anything. And that attitude had even spread to their spiritual life. I don't even need God. And Jesus looks at them and he says, no, listen, I, when I look at you, I see somebody who's miserable, not rich. Somebody who's worthy of pity, not envy. You think you don't need anything, but you really need an awful lot. You're poor and you're naked and you're blind. You don't have anything of real value. You've filled your life by making this earth your heaven instead of looking to the heaven that's to come. And so he tells them, repent. But until you do, I'm just going to let you play with your mud pies inside the house where you've locked me out. And, and, and I could be this, this father that goes and knocks in the door and just throws the mud pie in your face. How do you like that? How does that taste? This life that you've invented for yourself. But instead, I'm going to be this loving father who stands at the door and just knocks until you exhaust yourself and you realize the life you've made really doesn't add up to real life. It's not real fellowship with me. That's what life is. And you're going to come and open the door and I'll fellowship with you forever and ever and ever. And so Jesus finishes up that letter to the church at Laodicea and you feel like it's done. I mean, you feel like that could be the end of the book of the Revelation, but, but then Jesus launches into this second vision straight away. And, and I wanted to close out this series not by looking at the last letter to the last church, but really I wanted us to look at together what we're all going to be experiencing as the church eternal. You know, um, I, some, some of you have told me, like, so these are hard messages. I mean, they're making us think. It's making me, I, I don't like when you step on my toes like this. And um, just know that the Lord is stepping on my toes too, right? And, and, and so we've kind of examined, who are we to be as the church? What do we need to change? What do we need to, to, to do differently so that we're living as the church God's created us to be? And, and so I want to give us some hope. Because guess what? There's going to be a day when it's all wrapped up. And we're going to be in heaven with him forever and ever and ever. The church eternal. So that's what we're going to look at today. Uh, David Crowder has this great song, Everybody Wants to Go to Heaven. But nobody wants to die. You know, you know that song? Have you heard that? Um, that's so true. I mean, everybody wants to go to heaven, but the dying part. People really don't like that part. Uh, there's a statistic that is in Owen. It says 78% of Americans believe that they expect to go to heaven when they die. But the vast majority of those people, they, they would also tell you, well, I don't really read the Bible regularly. I don't attend church regularly. And um, I, I don't regularly pray. 
And so the question is, well, why do they want to go? You know, like, what do they think heaven's going to be like? Like, you don't want to be around God's people now that you're going to want to be around God himself. And, have, you know, there's, there's sort of this image of a heaven that they've created in their own minds, you know, where you can sort of do whatever you want. Maybe you're an angel playing harp if you like to sing. Or, or maybe it's going to be like adventure sports and you're going to be able to skydive and do whatever it is. And there's, heaven is sort of their own making. And, and Jesus wants us to see this glimpse into the real thing. Um, the uh, explorer Marco Polo. Yeah, did you guys know he was an explorer? It was not just a pool game that you play with when you're a kid, right? Marco Polo. You know, it, it, he was an actual real guy. And so uh, at the end of his life, uh, his detractors said, listen, recant. There's no way that you saw all the stuff that you saw through all of Asia and China, all this stuff. There's no way that you saw all of it. And his last and final words to them were, I've only told you half of what I've seen. Listen, I think this is the image that should be conjured up for us as we look at John's vision, his glimpse into what eternity is going to be like. Now, he tells us and he writes down as much as his human brain can and his human mouth can really explore, but I think it's just this half of a picture of what heaven is really going to be like. But let's look at this picture of what he said. Revelation chapter 4. We're going to start with verse 1. Look at our experience as the church eternal. After this, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here. I'll show you what must take place after this. Um, this is the same voice that spoke to him before, the first vision. This is the second vision, a new vision. And this is Jesus' voice. And so Jesus, he, he's not there on the beach on the island of Patmos with John anymore. Now uh, he's back in heaven and somehow there's this doorway, this portal that opens into the heavenly dimension. And out of the doorway, John hears Jesus' voice. Hey, you, buddy, come on up, right? And instantly he hears the same voice, he recognizes him. And he knows he's supposed to go. He says, these are the things that must take place. Now, uh, I, I don't know about you, but that's a great comfort to me. Uh, Jesus already knows what's going to happen, right? Uh, that should give us a lot of comfort in life. It's not, well, you know, this is probably going to happen. I mean, you could go to the bank and uh, maybe you could take a gamble. It's like an 80-20. I mean, you know, it may work out in the end. It may not work out. I mean, he doesn't say that. He says, this is going to happen. Whether you think this is the best news in the world or you think this is the most awful news, hey, guess what? Your opinion really doesn't matter. This is going to happen. This is what's going to happen. This must take place. Come on up here. Now, a lot of scholars really think that this is a picture of what's going to happen as soon as the Lord calls his church home. Um, they, they, a lot of people believe that when Jesus says, come up here, that's a, a great symbolic nature of not just Jesus calling John to come up, but he's calling all of his church to come home, right? The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that, that at one certain point in time, we don't know when, we don't know the day, we don't know the hour, but, but the Lord is going to split the eastern sky. And there's going to be a, the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ are going to rise first. And then we that are alive and remain will be called up together with them and meet him in the air. And so will be with the Lord forever. And so there's this image of what's happening in this grand eternal scheme that Jesus is worth. Look what it says, verse 2. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Uh, he's describing these precious jewels. Like he, he can't even describe the light show that is coming from the one who sits on the throne. This is God the Father. God the Father is spirit, the Bible tells us. And so there's this glory that is reflecting off of God the Father on the throne. He can't see him. He just sees light. He just sees these unbelievable pictures of light. And so these stones he uses, Jasper and Carnelia, and they, they had a full range of stones. A lot of people think he was said it, it was the reflection that comes like out of a diamond how you see all these colors and prisms that come out of it and um, have you ever been to a, a rock concert with an amazing light show I, I've got a couple of pictures of these right you know uh, here's two pictures at the the light show you know you've got like this spectrum of colors coming through the hazer and you know it looks like uh, our worship service on Sunday morning right there right no I'm just kidding all right look, look at the next one here we go uh, can you imagine all these beams of light now think about this we've come up with this stuff right this is stuff of our own creation. Can you imagine what the true glory of God is going to look like? 
I mean, this is unbelievable. It says, it's the brightest reflection of glory I've ever seen in my life. I can't even look at it. It's like these images that are coming through this bright stones, this diamond reflecting out in reds and oranges and golds. And there's this full circle rainbow around the throne of God. What, what was the rainbow for? What was it a symbol of? From Genesis, way back after the flood? It was God's promise. What? That he wasn't going to destroy the whole earth by flood again. But you know, he didn't say he wasn't going to destroy the whole earth. Just not by flood, right? He gave us the promise, this arc of a rainbow, right? And you know, who knew? Uh, you've seen the YouTube video. It's a double rainbow all the way across the sky, right? This is a full circle rainbow all the way around the throne of God. It, it, a lot of people believe that Jesus is saying through this image, look at this, I, I made the promise once that I wasn't going to destroy the rest of the world through flooding. Well, guess what? There is a destruction that is coming. The old heaven, the old earth is going to be burned up. And then guess what? It's full circle, baby. There is nothing that's going to happen ever again. I'm going to make the new heaven and the new earth and it's going to be there forever and ever and ever. And every time you look at me and the Spirit of God and you see this full circle rainbow, you'll know that nothing can ever come against us ever again. That's beautiful. This picture. Look at what happens. Verse 4. Around the throne were 24 smaller thrones. And seated on those thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their head. Now, this, this word for crown, it, it, it's the victor's crown. It's a reward that the Lord promises those who are faithful in service to him. So we don't know who these people are. Some people think, well, it's the leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel, right? You know, you get the Old Testament, then you got the 12 apostles. And so maybe it's like the 12 and the 12 and there's 24. We, we, we don't know. We just know that these people are elders over the kingdom of God. These 24 leaders are some of the most passionate worshipers that have ever existed. These are people that love the Lord with all of their heart. They've served him with all of their heart. They've given their their lives in service to him and the Lord has rewarded them with this crown. He's clothed them with these white garments. Now, now I, I have to believe as I'm reading this, um, all of the rewards happen at one time, right? And, and so it's not like, well, you get your reward today and you get your reward tomorrow and you get your reward. Uh, your, hold on, your, your last name starts with a T. Like it's going to be a couple thousand years, right? And, and all the rewards happen around this singular moment of the Bema Seat Judgment of Christ. Every believer will stand before him. All the books are going to be open and there's no, not going to be any condemnation against us, the Bible says, because all of our sin has been covered over by the blood of the Lamb. But every opportunity that we've had for Christ is going to be opened up and, and the Lord's going to look and he's going to see how we've stewarded our lives and then he's going to reward us with these different crowns that mean different things and there's this picture of 24 little thrones and these elders these worship leaders that's going to lead the throngs of millions of people scattered all around them in worship they have their crowns on they've been clothed in white garments and they're ready look at what it says verse 5 from the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. How many of you have ever been to a crystal clear beach? Anybody? One person. Fantastic. All right, well, let me give you some envy because here's some pictures I stole off of the internet. I haven't been to these places, but we can dream together, right? Now, these are real pictures. Look at that boat. It looks like it's floating in the air. Look at the next one. The next one's even more power. It looks like they're just somebody superimposed a boat over top of that crystal clear water, doesn't it? I mean, wouldn't you like to be there and vacation there? Look at this next one. This is an aerial view. It literally looks like a boat is flying. It looks like somebody got on the, the old Chitty Chitty Bang Bang and like put on the flubber, right? And then the boat is just like hovering over something. That's the crystal clear water. And as John looks around the throne of God, there is nobody even close to the throne of God. His glory is too powerful. It's too amazing. It's too beautiful to see. But he sees there's this crystal clear water, 360 degrees all around the throne of God. God's in this island by himself. And then around the crystal waters on the beaches all around, there's 24 elders circled all around the throne of God. Of God, can you imagine what it would be like? And, and and you hear as the Lord speaks, it's just like this sound of thunder. 
this thunderous sound echoes out all across the heavens and he he speaks the glory of God shines even brighter and it's like lightning before your eyes Uh, have you ever seen lightning up close Uh, we had a community group uh, fellowship time over at uh, some friend's house some members of our C group and uh, it started to pour down rain we were were having a bonfire which that's not great when it's raining Um, and so we all went into their detached garage we're all out in the garage and it starts to thunder a little bit and we're thinking well you know I'm glad we're in the garage I mean it is a metal building this should be safe and and so we're looking at it and like water is piling up at the entrance to the doorway and, and then all of a sudden we're over at the door looking out and lightning strikes literally like 10 feet from us and hits a tree. And I want to tell you, it was the most brilliant flash I have ever seen in all of my life. Like I thought, am I blinded? Like, uh, yes, Lord, do I need to fast three days and scales are going to come off my eyes? Like, I didn't know what was going on, but I look and, and, and lightning had burned through this tree. There was, there was a crowbar seated in the, the crux of the tree and lightning came down, struck the crowbar and sent it shattering all the way into the yard. It was crazy. The power of this lightning. Now, I want you to think about this. Just think about this. Millions and millions and millions of believers. Every person that's ever named the name of Jesus. Scattered around the throne of God. And you can look and you see this beautiful, brilliant light. And every time you hear him speak, lightning fires out of the throne 360 degrees all the way around right through to where you are and you see this unbelievable power and glory right up close can you imagine what that's going to be like it says that it rumbles like thunder you you ever been to an insane concert where the bass is just way too high and it like literally just makes your whole body vibrate that's this picture of when God speaks all of us vibrate this unbelievable picture look at what it says in the rest of verse 6 and around the throne on each side of the throne there are four living creatures full of eyes in the front and behind and the first living creature like a lion the second living creature like an ox the third living creature with the face of a man and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight like th- th- this is the image that I want you to get Here- here's what's going on so there's there's God the Father, His presence, the Spirit of God there in the middle on this island and on His throne. Around it is this sea of crystal clear water. And there's 24 elders seated all around the crystal sea. And there's the flock of every believer that's ever believed scattered around 360 degrees. All pointed in at God the Father. And on each side, on the north, the south, the east, and the west, there is this creation of God, this beautiful winged creature. Uh, They have different faces. One looks like the face of a lion, the king of all the untamed beasts. One looks like the face of an ox is the king of all tamed animals. Then you have one that has the face that looks like man, the king over all creation. Then you have one that it looks like the face of an eagle, the king of all the birds. So you have all of creation represented. North, south, east, and west. And these creatures that from the moment of their creation, they have eyes all over their front and eyes all over their back. So get this. Don't don't miss this. This is so powerful. Eyes are always looking at the glory of God. That's the ones looking in, right? And then eyes that are looking out, looking at all of our responses to the glory of God. All day, every day. From the moment they were created. I want you to think about this. This was their whole role. This was their whole point of creation. To see the glory of God And reflect that out to everybody around them. To see the beauty and the wonder and the majesty of the Spirit of God. And then to reflect that out and see people's responses to the glory and the majesty and the beauty of God. Some commentators think that these are representations of Jesus. And it's this this deal in the book of Matthew. Jesus is viewed as the lion of the tribe of Judah. The royalty from the Jewish house. From the book of Mark. It's a picture of the ox. The servant. The burden bearer of our sins. In the book of Luke. Jesus is God with us. He is the human. that is it, God's pulled on skin and become flesh. In the book of John. He is the spirit of God. The sword over all of us like 
the eagle. All of creation is represented and all of creation looks at the glory of God and reflects that out to everybody else that's around. What an amazing picture. That was their sole responsibility. Look what it says, verse 8. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, all full of eyes, all around and within, day and night, they never cease to say, read this with me, holy, holy, holy. Let's, let's start that over. You got like, you know, these are winged creatures, people. Like, they're excited about what they've been doing. Like, they got this down. They've been doing this from the moment they were created. Like, we got to read this with some enthusiasm, all right? This is what heaven is going to be like in this one moment, this snapshot, this image of time. And so, let's read this together with a little fervor, okay? Like, let's cheer for it like we would for the Panthers in the first, second, and third quarters. All right, here we go. You ready? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. They look at God the Father. They see this Spirit of God in all of His beauty. And they say, there's nobody like you. There never has been anybody like you. All of creation from all of eternity past. Right now in the present. All the way into the future. There will never be anything like you God. You are holy. You're worthy. You're holy to the uttermost. We're going to say it three times. Because once just isn't enough. You're amazing. You're beautiful. You're glorious. You're Lord over everything. There's nothing that exists that isn't under your feet. You're God over all. You were. And you are. And you'll still be. Tomorrow. I love that. Look at verse 9. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who's seated on the throne who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who's seated on the throne and they worship him who lives forever and ever. And they cast their crowns down before the throne saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. Because you created everything. And by your will, they existed and they were created. I love this image. Here's these 24 elders. And they're not just doing this themselves. Look right here. All of humanity that has named the name of Jesus. We're doing the same thing. They're our chief worship leaders. They're the elders who are leading the throng of God in worship. And in this moment, we've been rewarded our crowns. We've been rewarded our white robes of glory that, that Jesus has given to us. And in the middle of this moment, there's God the Father. And He's glorious and He's beautiful and He speaks. And thunder rips through the crowd and lightning pours all around us. And the beasts, they say, these unbelievable creations of God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come come and they say you're worthy of all praise there's nobody worthy of praise like you God it doesn't matter if you're the best football player on the world it doesn't matter if you're the best wife or the best husband or the best dad or the best business owner nobody is worthy of praise like you God you're worthy of all glory you're worthy of all honor. That means that we give you your due. There, there's nobody, nothing that we have that shouldn't be at your disposal, God. So we give you every single thing. You have all honor. Not us. We're not keeping it for ourselves. You're worthy of all thanks. We give you all thanks. That's, that's what the winged creatures say. Now in response to that, all the elders... All the throng of all humanity, they bow down and worship. They can't contain themselves. They're like, We're not, we can't sit down anymore. Like, are you serious? We've seen the glory of God. Why are we still sitting down? This is crazy. Everybody stand up. Now everybody get down on your face before God because look at this. It's the God of the universe. He's worthy of all praise. He's worthy of all honor. He's worthy of all power. Get your... Crowns, chuck them in as far as you can throw them. All right, you can only throw it that way. That's all right. Yeah, I know you're a lefty. All right, here we go. Throw it further. All right, now throw it further. Somebody help him. Somebody throw his crown up, please. Right, and they throw the crowns as far as they go. And they bow on their face and they worship. Now, look, there's one word different that we say than what the created angels say. We say... You're worthy of all glory. That means he's worthy of all of our praise, right? 
Nobody else is worthy of praise like God. He's worthy of all honor. That means we give him his due. We take what's in our hands, the only thing we have of value, and we chuck it to God. Because he's worthy. He's worthy. He's worth. That's, it's his due. All of our great successes that he's rewarded to us, it's all because of him anyway. It's all because of his spirit living in us. And we're like, why do we get the reward? It's all him. Chuck it up to him. And then we say one word different. Instead of thanks, we say all power be unto you. This word power, it's, um, it's dunami. It, it, it's sort of this image, not of explosive power. I mean, it's that where we sort of get our word dynamite from. But it, it's not like dynamite power in that way. Do you know what it really means? It's the power to create and make things. It's this unbelievable creative power. And so we're in this moment in history where the church has been called up before God. But there's still stuff going on on the earth. The tribulation is about to happen on earth. We still have Christ coming back and we're going to reign with him for a thousand years. We still have the final battle, the last battle where Christ just destroys all this stuff. We've still got the great white throne judgment that's to come when every person that has rejected Jesus as their Savior, all of Satan, all of his demons, they're chucked into the lake of fire forever and ever and ever. All that's still to come. And you know what else is still left to come? For God to burn up this world and the old heaven and create this new, wonderful heaven and earth that are joined together that nobody can ever take away. And, and, and so we look at God and we say, you're worthy of every bit of praise. You're worthy of every honor. We don't have anything else to give. Like if we had more to give you, we would give it. Like if we had other crowns stashed away, like back in our cabinet, back home. Like we would take that crown. We would chuck it to you. But everything we have, it's yours, God. Like you're worthy of everything. And God, you're worthy of all power. God, create this new thing. You, you created the first earth. You created the first heaven. And guess what? God, we're so looking forward to that day in a thousand years when, when you come and you destroy everything else and you take away sin's final chance on the earth and Satan and his demons are wrapped up and thrown into the lake of fire and you burn up this old heaven and this old earth in all of its beauty and grandeur that's been stained by sin and it's put away like a carpet dragged out from underneath it and you create this new heaven and new earth and will be with you forever and ever and ever you have power to create this new thing that's our prayer to him and we cast it all down because he's worthy I, I try my best like I wish I was an artist right so that I could draw for you this image because it would be life changing for us um, but I'm not so I did my best with circles and triangles, all right? So don't laugh at me because this took me a long time, all right? But, but here's this picture, this best image that I can see. Here's God the Father, the triangle, this. He's on this throne in the middle of this island, this glory radiating from him all around in this perfect rainbow. And there's the, the four created angelic beings, north, south, east, and west. And there's the crystal sea. And around those little white circles, it's the 24 elders who have been seated on thrones, the chief worship leaders. And then there's the throng of us. Now, I know it looks like candy corns, but that is unfortunate. <laughs> it was supposed to look like I was thinking of the song, red and yellow, black and white, they're precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. And so I tried to create that. Like I tried to create this representation. But you know what? That didn't work. And you know what I was getting ready to do? I was getting ready to just to make it easy because I, I didn't want it to take three hours to make this slide because I had to make each individual circle. I thought, okay, here's what I'll do. Like I'll just fill up one quarter and I'll make them all black. And one quarter and I'll make them all brown. And one quarter and I'll make them all white. And, and the Lord's like, uh, you can't do that. Like, that's not an accurate picture. Hello? And I'm like, I know it's not, but that would be way easier to make an image. And he's like, no, 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 no. You can't do it because, listen, there's no sections in heaven, right? Like, you know that, right? Uh, all of God's children from every tribe and every nation and every tongue, you're going to be standing next to a Kenyan and you're going to be standing next to a Cambodian and you're going to be standing next to uh, somebody else. And listen, here's the deal. You're going to love them. 
And they're going to love you too. It doesn't matter if you're rich and you have a big McMansion or you are a poor person that lives as a squatter in a stall. You are going to be together. And there's going to be no separation. There's not going to be like, hey, yeah, we're over in like uh, the Presbyterian section. Have you seen it? Like you turn left by Frozen Chosen Lane and then we go over here and it's like, oh, we're over in the Methodist section. Like we're over in the Methodist section. We're right on the corner of open heart, open door. And then, then you go over to the Southern Baptist section. Like we've got our place by Jesus because we talk about him the most. And then, then we're over here by the church of God. Like over on this section, we've, we've got like the Pentecostal section. And that's like over where the Holy Spirit hangs out the most. And so, you know, we're over there by that section. And, uh, and no, there's, there's no separation. We're just going to be one church. What Jesus prayed is his final prayer in John 17. God, make them one. As you and I are one, you realize there will be no denominations. And not just like the people that call themselves non-denominational, which means you're Southern Baptist with a cool praise band. Like, not just, like, there literally will be no denominations. You know what I'm saying? Like, it'll be everybody all together as one. And, and here's the amazing thing. Listen to this. This is what I want you to see. I just want you to dream with me about what this day is going to be like. Now you can shout amen anytime, alright? Like you can cheer, you can celebrate because this is the reality that waits for us who believe. Do you know there will be no more marriage issues in heaven? I heard some husbands say amen. You better watch out. Your wife needs to say it too or else you're in trouble, right? Now listen. Do you know there's not going to be one person in the relationship trying to control the other person? And there's not going to be any fights. There's not going to be like any issues of, well, I'm the leader and you're supposed to submit. Like there's not going to be any sort of marital issues at all. There's not going to be any conflicts because Jesus is Lord over everybody. Do you know there's not going to be any parenting issues? Somebody say amen on that one. You know, there's not going to be any issues with your parents because teenagers, your parents finally will get it. Amen. Like, amen, right? They'll know it and you'll know it too, right? I mean, there's not going to be any rebellion. There's not going to be any sneaking around. There's not going to be lying behind your back. There's not going to be any sort of parenting issues. There's no more prodigals, amen? Like there's no more people that have been raised up to know God and then they walk away and your heart is just like, God, when are you going to bring them back? He's already brought them back. They're home in that moment. You know there's not going to be any more body issues? Yeah. Like, um, you're going to have perfect health. You're going to have perfect stamina. Like, you're not going to need a nap. I mean, you can take one if you want to. But, like, you don't even need a nap. Right? It'll be for pleasure, not because you can't keep your eyes open at the stoplight anymore. Right? Listen, uh, you, you won't wear down. You're going to have perfect food and you'll like it. I mean, like, that's... Right? No more aches, no more pains, no more diseases, no more diabetes, no more cancer, no more RA, no more sickness, no more fevers, no more surgeries, no more pain. Isn't that amazing? You know there's not going to be any more emotional issues. Have you thought about that? No more hurt feelings. No more feeling left out. No more disrespect. No more depression. No more anxiety. You realize you will not be fearful of anything in that moment. Nothing can stir up a feeling of fear because Jesus is Lord over all of it. You, you realize that there's no more doubt, no more pain, no more unforgiveness, no more wounds, no more memories of the old wounds that are still scarred over. Do you realize you're going to be perfectly cared for by every person that you see? Perfect treatment. From every single person. No more frustration in traffic. Everybody will know how to drive. No more unrighteous anger. No more unrighteous anger, right? No more harsh words that's ever spoken. Can you imagine what that's going to be like? Do you know there's not going to be any more spiritual issues? There's no more evil. No more sin. No more temptation. Guys, you will never struggle with lust ever again. Right? 
Uh, ladies, you're not going to struggle with whatever it is you struggle with. Gossip or whatever it is. I don't Whatever your sin is. I'm just throwing one out there. Right? But there's not going to be any selfishness. There's not going to be any demons to fight. You're not going to have to say, flee from me in the name of Jesus. Because I have this. Right? Like you're just going to be perfect in relationship with the Lord. No old nature that's dead but keeps trying to resurrect itself that you have to keep on killing off. You're going to fully know God and be fully known by God. You're going to live in the depth of perfect love, perfect fellowship, perfect communion, perfect peace. All the mysteries about faith, all the mysteries about theology, all the mysteries about doctrine, you're going to get it. You're just going to know it. It's going to be perfect. And you know what? Look right here at me. None of that will ever cross your mind. Do you know why? Because the only thing that will cross your mind in those first few moments is God, you're worthy of all glory. You're worthy of all honor. I wish I had something more to give to you. Like I'm chucking you my four crowns, but I wish I had 70. God, I wish I could just, God, you want my clothes too? Like take that, whatever it is. God, take everything. You're worthy of everything I've got. God, please, you're worthy of all power. Wrap up this final thing. Work out your plan. Let the tribulation happen. God, let the thousand years happen. Let the final battle happen. Let the destruction of this old heaven and earth happen. So God, we'll just be with you forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. God, let your power create again. You, you realize that, right? Like you're not going to be thinking, Woo, man, my joints don't hurt anymore. Man, I'm so glad my spouse and I have a great relationship now. I mean, we're not married, but we're like still friends. I mean, man, I'm so glad that my kids respect me now. Man, I'm so glad I don't have to deal with these mental issues anymore of depression and who I am. I'm so glad I don't have any anxiety anymore. God, I'm so glad I'm not battling spiritual things anymore because your only thought will be praise God. You're only worthy of praise. You're worthy of all honor. You're worthy of all power. That'll be your thought. Now look right here. Don't miss this. If this is going to be your thought in eternity, shouldn't we get a head start here? Like if that's what our thought process is going to be forever, shouldn't we like go ahead and make that our thought process now? So it's not foreign to us? Like, you don't want the first time you give all glory to God to be that day, do you? You don't want the first time that you give all honor, right? Like, you give him his due. Like, if you're struggling with, like, giving or tithing or, like, your time or, like, whatever it is. Like, you don't want that day to be the first day that you give all that he's due, right? Right? You don't want that first day to be the day that you pray and say, you're worthy of all creative power, so make something new in me. Create something new. Like, you don't want that to be the first day, right? So if that's our eternal mindset, let's make that our now mindset. Amen? Because here's the deal. When you... When you make that your now mindset and your spouse makes that their now mindset, your marriage won't be perfect, but it will get better because you're looking at Jesus and not each other. When you do that as a parent and your kids do that, like even if your kids don't and you still do, like your parenting won't be perfect, but, but it'll be different, right? Right? When you still struggle with emotional issues and anxiety and depression and like you're still fighting those spiritual battles, like, but you're saying, God, you got all glory. You're the only one worthy of praise. My job is not worthy of praise. Like, my promotion, my house, my, my bank account, that's not worthy of any praise. You're the only one worthy of praise. God, listen, my family, they're worthy of honor. 
but nowhere near compared to what you are worthy of honor. My kids, they're worthy and they're due my time, but nowhere near what you're due my time. God, my job is worthy of my honor. I'm supposed to do everything like I do it for God, but I will not do anything like I pursue you, God. Right? My money, that's your money, God. My time, that's your time, God, because that's what you're due. That's the correct response, right? When you do that, your life isn't perfect, but it'll be better because it's ordered the right way. And whenever you look at God and you say, you're worthy of all power. You created everything, and I know you're creating me into the image of your son day after day after day. So God, today, I need you. I desperately need you to create in me this image of Jesus because I'm not it. Your life won't be perfect, but it'll be different, right? If that's what we're doing for all of eternity, then let's make sure that we're doing it now. Let's pray. I really hope that the Holy Spirit has spoken through me to, to your heart today so that you get this image of what it's going to be like. Um, this week, I was with one of our families um, at the deathbed of a loved one. And I want to tell you, in that moment, when somebody is getting ready to cross over from death to life eternal with the Lord, it's amazingly clear what's priority and what's not. I watched one of our church members. They were just loving on that person there in the bed. And the person couldn't even respond back. They're just saying, I love you. I love you. I love you. It's okay. You can go home now. You can be with Jesus. Instantly, my mind totally took me back to how that happened for me when I was a, almost 13 years old with my dad. He was laying in the hospital, riddled with cancer, and we're just telling him, it's okay, you go on, you be in heaven with Jesus. We're going to be okay. Listen, in those moments, it didn't matter what job my dad had. It didn't matter how much money we had. It didn't matter what he had accomplished. It mattered what his relationship with Jesus was. And it mattered how he had passed that on to us. That was what mattered. You know what? Today, I really hope that the Holy Spirit's given you this picture, this little snapshot. But here's the amazing thing. I don't think John was able to describe half of what he saw. Now listen, um, if you're here today and you've never started a relationship with Jesus, this is not your destiny. Not yet. But it can be. The Bible says that if you'll confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, meaning you surrender all of your life to Him, and then you believe in your heart God raised Jesus from the dead, you're saved. So if you've never started a relationship with Jesus, I'm not saying if you believe He's God's Son. Like, I'm asking, have you declared He's going to lead your life? He's ruler over your life. He's your Savior and the leader of your life. If you've never done that, today is the day of your salvation. So right now in this moment, just whisper these words to Jesus. If the Holy Spirit is convicting you, then say yes. Surrender. Just say, dear Jesus, dear Jesus, from this moment on, you're going to be the Lord over my life. I give you all control and surrender because that's your rightful role. God, I believe you took my punishment and I believe you came back from the dead. And I ask you to come into my life and change me, save me, and give me that destiny of heaven with you. The Bible says if you really, really have surrendered your life in that way because the Spirit has drawn you that you've crossed over from a destiny of death to a destiny of life. And I want to celebrate that with you. you know, when you came in, you got one of those little response cards. Put your name and address on there. Put a check mark in the top box that says, I pray to receive Christ. Just leave it on your seat. And I've got a book that I want to mail to you this week so you can start this new relationship with God out on the right foot. But there are many of you in this house today 
myself included, that we need a picture of the church eternal. We need to do now what we're going to do in eternity. He's the only one worthy of all glory and praise. He's the only one worthy of all honor. He's worth it all. He's the one worthy of all power to create in you something new. New in your marriage. New in your parenting. New in your emotions. New in your spiritual life. And so right now, I'm just going to ask you if the Spirit has touched you in that way. You just come and just pray. Maybe you just want to come and pray and say, Thank you, God, for the eternity that awaits me. God, let that affect how I live every day right now. Keep this picture burned in my mind of us all bowing in worship before you. So maybe today you just want to do what those elders did, what we're all going to do. Maybe you just want to come up front and just bow down on your face before God and say you're worthy of worship. That's what I'm going to do. And so the band is just going to play softly. I'm going to ask you to stand. Just keep your eyes closed. Whatever the Holy Spirit tells you to do in this moment, just be obedient. All right? Go ahead and stand. Lord, rule and reign over this time. In the name of Jesus, amen.